Welcome to Card Players The Circuit, hosted by your favorite set, Scott Huff, Gavin Smith, and Joe Seabach. That's right, everyone. You are listening to CardPlayer.com's The Circuit. We are broadcasting on Sports Byline Radio on Sirius Channel 122, on CardPlayer.com, and on the iTunes Music Store as a podcast. Scott Huff, Gavin Smith, and Joe Seabach from the Bellagio in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're here in the Fontana Room yet again. I call it yes. something different every time, by the way. Fontana Room, Fontana, Fontana Bar, Lounge. Fontana Lounge. Which one is it? It's the Fontana Bar. I, I, I believe think it's right, the room. That's called the Fontana... Fontana Slamma Jamma. Let's just put it this way. If you want to come down here and play in the Bellagio Cup, come to the room right near the main cage of the casino, and you'll (laughs) see all the poker players, and you can play in one of these $1,000 events, which today, yet again, so far, 414 players, including alternates, which means probably an above $100,000 first prize yet again at the Bellagio Cup. Hey, you want to know what happened to me today? I do want to know what happened to you today. I was was down at Caesars, and this guy came by me. Uh, It was in a wheelchair, right? He goes, hey, Gavin, what's going on? Whatever. And I'm like, hey, it was was cool. He goes, he, he goes, I, I've got this. He was donating a, a thing to Kenna. Kenna James had his charity tournament today, and they're going to have a signed auction tonight. So he was donating the signed uh, Mike Sexton framed card player cover. Mm-hmm. He goes, I'm going to give this to Kenna to, to, to auction off tonight. Right? And I go, oh, that's really cool of you. He goes, yeah, this thing that Kenna's doing is really cool. He goes, it's Slambastica. <laughs> that's that to me. Did you it, really? All, I, 100% he said that to me. And I go, Slambastica. Yeah, Slambastica. You have to correct him. I, I corrected him. Slambastica. I corrected him, but still, it was pretty cool. That this, is pretty awesome, you know, this, though. This uh, older guy in a wheelchair is like saying, it's Slambastica. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's pretty dope. That's pretty cool. I, I think it's Slambastica that he said Slambastica instead of Slambastica. Slambastica's yeah. catching on. It's kind of like the Smithisms. Um, Smithism. we, I just want to mention real quick, though, the 10,000 dollar event is going to be here in the Fontana room right. on August 7th through August 10th so come down here and take your crack at what I mean if they're getting these kind of kind of fields for these 1000s mm-hmm. and they're running satellites for the other ones it could be huge could be a lot of money to be made down here could be for world sure. series of poker part 2 um, so, Gavin, what were you? You were doing a charity tournament today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, Kenna, Kenna uh, was doing a charity tournament for uh, the Wounded Warriors project which is uh, all the the men and women who were on the front line in Iraq and have got injured and, uh, um, you know, he's raising money for them. Like people that have got, you know, had life, life-changing life injuries and whatnot. And mm-hmm. one of the guys that was there today, he's from Virginia. I can't rem- This is terrible, but I can't remember his name. But uh, they came in and they introduced him to me and asked me if I would give him a tutorial on poker. And this guy's got two prosthetic, prosthetic legs because he was driving and... Uh, 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 a missile of some sort um, hit the vehicle that he was in, and he lost both of his legs. So this guy was down there, and I was just showing him all my hands. He was watch- he was just playing behind me and trying to learn a little bit about the game. He was a really nice guy. So I mean, it's a really it's a it's a pretty cool project. And there, so they had a charity tournament at Caesars. Uh, I think it had four or five tables. Um, all the money goes to charity. We we all paid a thousand to get in, and it's all going to charity. Um, and then they have a silent auction tonight, and you know, hopefully they'll make a, uh, a ton of cash from. I wish you called me because I forgot I was supposed to go. Oh, yeah. Ken is not pissed. No, nah, Ken will be all right. Ken, okay. is, Ken is pretty cool. But, I mean, he, he's working real hard at it, too, and it's it's a real good cause. Right. And and, uh, and then, you know, I'm talking to this guy a little bit, and, and, he, and he's like, well, the one thing I've got to do, he goes, for me, I've got to, I've got to go back to Iraq and walk down the street, right? He, he's going, those guys tried to kill me, and I just got you know, I want to show them that, you know, they didn't do anything to me except for take, take my legs, you know? I'm like, ah, man. That's strong. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And I got one of my favorite phone calls as a result of this uh, charity event today from you. It was amazing. You were telling me, well, we might have to push back doing the show till about 5 o'clock today, Scott. You know, I don't have that many chips, but I have some chips. Three minutes later, I call back. The first thing I hear is laughter. <laughs> we can do the show at 3.30. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, Joey, uh, how about you? Have you paid off your what you owe to Gavin Smith at this point? Gavin you completely paid off. Are you guys straight. square? We are straight. I've paid off my debt like a man. And, and a well, woman. And a woman. <laughs> I've paid off my debt like a woman. I can hold my head low now as everyone in. Has your, da- uh, your dad taken you back on the family yet? He hasn't spoken to me in over two weeks. He's he's very upset. Uh, no, I th- I think he's accepted me. It's been a long World Series for the family. He actually just took the family, Joe. <laughs> think about the family. I think about the family. Hey, <laughs> I got my I got my picture taken the other night with Mikey, the, the primate, by the way. Nice. Think, we have to talk about that. Think, I have an email think, about that. Think, thinking of the bear and how he could teach a, teach a primate how to beat me. <laughs> and I got he, I got my pi- I got my picture taken with Mikey. Mikey was very sweet. I right. think I might buy a monkey. 
<laughs> Can you imagine like a if, good investment. if Gavin had a monkey that just hung out on his neck <laughs> all the time? <laughs> it would be Gavin, Joe, Joe Seabox, Scott Huff, and the monkey. And Mikey the, monkey, the chimp. Mikey the chimp. What were you saying, though? It's been a tough no. World Series for the I was family. just saying, unfortunately, he just took um, a, a gruesome beat. Um, in a 70,000 chip pod and got down to 2,000 and now he also has busted on the main event. It, it's carnage. I mean, every 20 minutes I'm getting a phone call from somebody, you know, friends are walking up, people are just, are falling like flies over there. So, uh, did it's you getting, guys it's lose, ugly. Did you guys lose a couple hundred thousand to the Brunsons too? No. Did that bet never get made? No, no, the bet no is final made. tables. The bet is made. The final Doyle, tables for any of them. Doyle, Doyle, Doyle made a final table of the no, horse? it's a event that, played events events. that we all play in. I didn't play in the horse, but... Oh, bad beat for the Brunson. It's, no, 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 no. It's, it's it's gotten so close to them losing two hundred to us so many times now. They've never come close to, to threatening us. We've it's threatened them at least five times. Bad beat for the Brunsons that Joe doesn't play all the games because Doyle got to that final table. No, right. it's, it's not a bad beat for anybody because it's they commonly played. Play the, the they same. know he's not going to play right. all the games. I guess I want to let you know something, Gavin. I think you've influenced our intern and being a take the best of it guy. Because speaking of prop bets, I got to call it out. Justin Schrunk actually beat Daniel Negrano in a prop bet. Daniel tried to shoot an angle on our poor intern. I want everyone out there to know that Daniel tried to shoot. An angle on him, Daniel. He bet him. Uh, Justin bet him two hundred dollars, uh, and, and he had to lay him five to one that he would not be at the featured table his first day of the main event. And I think if you're going to bet against a player, Daniel Negrano, not the guy you want to bet against in this bet of being at the, at, at the featured table, one? the featured table. Shrunk had to lay five to one. Are you an idiot? Apparently, Shrunk? I know he's a complete idiot. And Daniel had prior knowledge that he was supposed to be one of the people at the featured table. But guess what? Oh yeah, and Shrunk was drunk when he made this bet. But guess what? Daniel what? did not make it to the featured table, and now Ozar in turn. Two hundred dollars. Nice try shooting an why angle did, on him, Daniel. Why did Daniel not get to the final t- uh, to the feature table? I don't know, but he did not. And Justin Tronk has won two hundred dollars. But Daniel that's Trunk. not a take of the best of it. That's a take the that's way the worst. Way the worst. Way worst of the worst. Of <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is the opposite of taking I mean, the best of it. You, you might have been taking the worst of it. If Daniel had a late five. Exactly. Instead of the other way around. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, this is not a good example yeah. of, of not how a good example. Gavin's mind okay, works. then I won't blame it on you, Gavin, that he won two hundred dollars. I'll just say we turned him into a degenerate. How about that? Now it's time for some World Series poker news. World Series of Poker News. It's Slamastica. It's Slambastica. It's Slambastica. Indeed it is. Slam crudum dilium diastica. I realized oh, something, work. guys. What's up? Poker, poker days are like dog years. Because in poker, one day lasts 96 hours. But we are finally through days 1A, 1B, uh-huh. 1C, and 1D. I gotcha. And, uh, <laughs> I got that. I didn't get, it took me, it took me 24. a second. I was <laughs> trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and in day one D, our chip leader coming out of that was Hung Tran. Is this the same person as no, Peter, Peter Tran? Tran because, because, right. Well, they changed his name to Hung on the website, but maybe that's his real name? Maybe. That's probably okay. what it is. Well, Peter Tran, 177,475. Also out of that, Alex Belandon. Oh. Alex Belandon, 97,400. Daryl Gigabet Dickin I up bet there. He, I bet he called a, more than one person with Queen Jack suited yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and one Joe Hashem, 86,950 in chips, taking into uh, tomorrow's day two, which would be day 2B. Uh, day 2A began today, and a tournament director announced the first prize in the main event this year will exceed $12 million. The director wow. also announced that there will be 12 instant millionaires at the end of the tournament. That's unbelievable. Pretty amazing. I think there's a very good chance that there will be two instant millionaires sitting at this table when Theo the man Tran. <laughs> so speaking of trans. Brings it home. I'd love to be an instant millionaire on somebody's back. That's We're actually going to talk a little bit about that uh, later in, in Poker Talk with Big G and the Baby Kangaroo, actually. All right. Um, so elimin- early eliminations, David Williams apparently took a pretty sick beat. Uh, and then was busted shortly after. Noah Boken was eliminated. Final tableist from last year, Andrew Black, was eliminated. Um, in some World Series poker news, you know the Phil Ivey old people are back. Yeah, yeah, I forgot that. Where are they from? They're from Jersey, right? I don't know, but the I just, fan club. They're they're back. Yeah. Would you, I mean, I think you've reached the pinnacle of celebrity when when senior citizens start following you around. Well, they've like, been following for a couple of years. I mean, this is not the first year. By I know. Any means. They make right. T-shirts about you and stuff. Yeah. I mean, what would you rather have? Would you rather have like some solid groupies or some senior citizens? What would you prefer? <laughs> I'm gonna go. I mean, for you know, everybody loves Phil Ivey, myself. anyways. But I mean, the ones who turn out are the Phil Ivey old people. I like wi- <laughs> Phil Ivey old like, people. I like women that come up to me and proclaim their love. Yeah. yeah, we'll have to get you some so senior I, Here's a question. Though. Would Maybe you rather be as have, good as Phil if we do? Here's a question. Would you rather have a 75-year-old who proclaimed her love for you or a hot 21-year-old who proclaimed her love for you? Mm. It's a difficult decision, I know. Well, I, I just like I, I like them all. He likes them all. All right. <laughs> Gavin is an equal opportunity. <laughs> and now it's time for Poker Talk with Big G and the Baby Kangaroo. Welcome back to Poker Talk, everyone. Uh, seriously, guys, though, today, the concept of the day will be, I mean, how do you deal with these donkeys that 
they call you with any two cards. They call you all the way down, and then they suck out on you on the river and take all your money. You know, what I got to be mean? honest with you. That's like the <laughs> dumbest I, question I don't even ever. know what that means. How do you deal with them? The dumbest question All ever. right, guys. I was clearly kidding. <laughs> Gee, I knew that was going to happen. I predicted before it happened that when I made that joke, you guys were going to go off on me. <laughs> so the real concept of the day is, what's up with vegan chicks? We all... What? Yeah. Sean's trying know. to get in here. Sean's I don't like here. I don't like vegan Scott, chicks. I'm okay. Uh, sorry, that was a typo. That was supposed to be Vegas chicks. What is happening? Oh, Vegas chicks. Oh. All right. But no, no, I'd like to address the vegan chicks because <laughs> I don't have a problem with vegetarians. But like, what I the hell is the problem with milk and cheese? <laughs> what is the problem with milk and cheese? There's no reason it comes to from an animal. Way. It comes from an animal is the thinking. And, and uh, by, yeah, by taking but, it, you're, but you're not, No, it. but you're not killing the animal. No, you're just squeezing its titties or something. You're oh. actually making it feel better. If your bladder was full with milk, you'd probably want or whatever. It's not in the bladder, I guess, but wherever it is. If right. your belly was full of milk, you'd probably want it squeezed out of you, too. Exactly. I, really, so, I would. I don't, you know, I actually, I used to not like vegan chicks at all. But That's actually, not the real concept either. Hey, hold real? on. Hold on. We're talking about vegan. <laughs> but now, I'm, I think vegan chicks are really hot. Yeah. I'm really into I, them. I'm not into them. Well, oh. Go ahead. Uh, no. <laughs> what? All right, we're not we're not gonna mention. It. Let's just keep going. Um, so here is the actual I know poker talk with Big say. G and the baby kangaroo. <laughs> I know what you're about to say. Staking arrangements, <laughs> and that was goes back to Theo Trans. Staking arrangements describe how they're used in the poker world and what some uh, so people out there who are thinking about staking their friends. I know that for a long time my friends would stake me with a horrible taking the horrible end of staking. Right. How do they work? I've and, staked and you several times. Well, staking, well you, but that's you don't count. I'm talking about friends who okay. probably actually basically couldn't afford to stake me. Basically, what sta- staking is obviously is when you know if you can't afford to play, but you're a good enough player. Somebody else might put the money up so that you can play in the tournament. Now, there's differences. There's what, what people would call like a, a one-time free roll. That's where if I say, Joe, I know you're running a little bad on your luck. You need some money. I'm going to put up 10000 You're going to play the World Series. Right. That's and, what you guys did for me, right? And that's what we did for and Scott. Then, and then we'll be done. Right. right. Now, for that, you would get a lot less of a percentage because I'm not going to be able to recoup my losses. Right. But if I were to say to Scott, to Joe, Joe, I know you're running a little bad. I'm going to stake you for the next year. Right. And then Whenever you cash, you're going to pay back everything we've, we've paid in entry fees, and then we'll split the profits. Known as makeup. Known right. as makeup. We'll, then we'll split the profits. Then Joe would get a much higher percentage of himself because I'm not taking as much a risk if Joe is a winning player. Right. Right. I'm really not taking any risk if he's a winning player. I'm just, right. I'm just investing money until such a time as he cashes. Right. right. So uh, really, probably like um, in, in the main event, an unproven player would probably get something like a 15 or 20 percent free roll. If, if they get to keep 15 or 20 percent of themselves. 20 free roll. But right. in, and then not have to repay the, the 10,000. But it, it, if it was a long-term agreement, um, an unproven player would probably start at about um, maybe 40 percent with makeup. And then, you know, as they prove themselves more and more and more, they'd work up to, you know, some people get 75, 80 percent. Uh, some players, when they, once they've proven themselves. Right. All right. Now it's time for Hand of the Day. Nice hand, sir. This, uh, I want to know how you think both players on the end of this uh, played it, and if we need to go past the break, we will. Um, a player from the five-seat raises 250. This was on an early level. I'm not sure exactly what the blinds were, um, but it was early level day one of the main event. Uh, a player from the five-seat raises 250 before the flop, and David Williams just flat calls his bet. The flop comes king, seven, six, with two spades, the seven and six of spades, and the five-seat bets 600. Williams calls. The turn comes to two of spades, putting a flush possible out there, and the five seat bets a thousand, and Williams again calls. The river brings the ten of diamonds, seed five bets a thousand, and Williams says, I'll just call, and then flips over two tens for a set, and the five seat turns over two aces. Um, I'm wondering what you guys think about the play from both David Williams with his two tens and from the aces, and especially. Did he have the aces of spades? He did have the, he aces, did have the aces, aces of spades, yeah. I think the guy with the aces of spades played it fine. I think uh, David's is kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm wondering. I mean, that play and then to just call on the river when you hit it, well, how no, he played I mean, the turn. I mean, well, he, obviously well, he got, didn't hit the yeah, nuts. I mean, he obviously got scared on the river. Right. When the guy was still betting. He obviously got scared that the guy might have three kings or or, or a flush. Or a flush, right? Right. Uh, but I mean, I think the call on the turn is ugh, stinky bad. Yeah, it's, it's a little gross. I mean, talk about it a little bit. That's what I was assessing before. I mean, I mean, the guy raised. Fair enough. You, you flat call with two tens. I think that's fine. Flop comes up king high, and you flat call again. Now that play I really like because now if this guy happens to have queens or jacks, you're almost always going to win that pot on the turn. Right. Right. But when he fires again on the turn, gig the jig's up, man. I mean, 
the guy's got an ace king or aces or kings. I mean, right. that's just it. Especially when it comes with a spade and the guy still right. fires. The, the point is, if he's not afraid, if it, with that kind of board, if he's still yeah. not afraid, uh, only only some psychos are going to try to run through the jacks or the queens, and that's fine. And, and if he outplays you, he outplays you. Who cares? It right. happens. But right. now nah, that, that's an atrocious call on the turn. David, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> but, I mean, David is a wild player, and everybody knows that. I mean, he's known for, I mean, he's done stuff like this with two fours. Literally in the same exact spot and just called somebody all the way down. You know when the when the board is something like king seven six three spades. All shame kinds of on you, stuff. David. <laughs> but when Gavin says on the turn though, when you guys say, "All right, he just called the river." Gavin just said on the turn, you have to know you're up against aces kings uh, or ace king. Why then is he just uh, is he just going to call on the river? Then well, when he hits it, he could get some value. Th- out think of about it. it. The hands he could have, the hands the guy could have. Right, well, kings would have him beat. One's up. kings, right. one's aces, one's ace king, and one of them's the nut and one of them's the nut flush. Right? right, there's there's really only four hands mm-hmm. probably that he can have. Right, so two of them beat you. Two of them don't beat you. Where's the value in raising? Got it. You know, if, if the guy bets a thousand, you make it three. Now the guy moves in. Are you going to fold your three tens? That's why you're the WPT yeah. Player of the Year, baby. Right after this, we will have phone calls and emails for us right here on the circuit. How does ten dollars in free poker cash sound? It's easy at vcpoker.com. Just log on, sign up, and get ten dollars free to start playing a wide range of games, including hold'em. Vcpoker.com makes it easy with the latest software, and your payments and payouts are always safe and secure at vcpoker.com. With sixty years of gaming excellence, vcpoker.com is a company you can trust. Sign up now for your free ten dollars. Log on to vcpoker.com/free35 and get your money for nothing and your chips for free. Welcome back to the circuit, everyone. Scott Huff, Gavin Smith, and Joe Seabach talking a little poker. And we have your emails and phone calls for us. Danny, take it away. Hey, guys. My name is George. I'm calling from Connecticut, and I got a question for Gavin. The question is, uh, we were watching it last night on the World Series of Poker Circuit event televised on ESPN. And, um, cousin, how drunk were you? I mean, seriously, it looked like uh, you were pounding back some uh, Manhattans, or I don't even know what the concoction was, but Jesus. So <laughs> He was actually very absent. Uh, was that I, thing at the end? Um, well, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I did not begin drinking until uh, Peter and I were already probably th- two or three hours into Heads Up Play. Um, I drank probably five, maybe six drinks. I was not drunk at all uh, during the play. Um, I did get ass fucking drunk after the game, though. <laughs> you have to get ass fucking drunk after you yeah. uh, lose heads they, up. Like they that. are rerunning yeah. you like Laverne and Shirley. You're yeah. on TV like every second of the day. You can't turn I, it without I, seeing Kevin Smith. I've actually had people start calling me Carmine Ragusa. <laughs> 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 All right, let's take the next call. Yes, my question um, is regarding an overpair versus an underset a after woman. the flop. If there's some way, as you improve as a poker player, to get away from that kind of a situation, or do you just have to accept it's one of the situations that you're probably going to lose a lot of money? <laughs> uh, my question is because that was how I went out of the World Series, and I just wanted wow. to know. Thank you. This is Phyllis Rosansky, and I would appreciate any information on that. You got it, honey. It's uh, I think, and I think that we talked about it uh, <laughs> last week where. It's all situational. There are times to get away. Sometimes you're going to be playing against a goofy player where you you just can't get away from it. You know, you've got an overpair. You just right. he does so much stuff. You sometimes you just have to go with it. You have to say, well, I hope you know this is one of those times he's trying to outplay me. Flat out, though, most of the time, if you have a set or an overpair, you're going to lose a bunch. You're right. not necessarily going to go broke, but you're going to lose a bunch. Basically, the only time you're not is to say if you got two red aces. You know, the flop comes up seven, eight, nine of clubs or some shit like that. You know, wow. then you might not, then you might not lose too much, but uh, but it's tough. It's when you very when tough. you when you get raggy, it, it it costs you money to find out where you're at in the hand, and it just you know you just got to accept that it happens. So, right. The one thing the one thing that I actually uh, wanted to bring up is in these really deep stack tournaments like the main event and where you know you have a ton of chips relative to the blinds, then it's much easier to get away. You know, if you have a pair of jacks and the flop's all raggedy and, you know, somebody bets and you decide to raise on the flop and then you get check raised on the turn, sometimes you just got to let that go because you have to say to yourself... Even, th- even then, though, you lost a bunch of chips, right? Well, you know, you lo- well, for, for example, the hand that I'm thinking of is the hand with my jacks. I, I right. did lose a bunch of chips, but I didn't lose the tournament. I didn't get no, 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 but you probably lost... You know, I lost like 3,500. 
So you lost thirty. So thirty five percent of your stock. Right. That's, that's, oh, pretty yeah. subst- that's pretty substantial. Oh, for sure. And for that's sure. like that's like pretty much a best case scenario, probably. Right. Absolutely, so, absolutely. But but know. but my only point is that yeah. sometimes in the, those early stages, you have to be able to say to yourself, and Gavin and I talk about this a lot. You, you just throw it away. A people are scared, and they're not going to stick in all their chips in the beginning of a tournament unless they have a monster's hand most of the time. And B, that extra, you know, tenth of a percent that you pick up there just isn't worth uh, the risk, you know, that at that point you're taking, you know, it could be your entire tournament if you're wrong. And for more on this subject, listen to yesterday's hand of the day, speaking of uh, overpairs against sets, where Sean Chacon went broke in the early levels of the main event. You guys broke that down pretty well. And Gavin's been handing out a lot of shame on yous lately, too, which I, I kind of like. Yeah. That might have to become a sound clip. All right, PokerShare.com. Uh, this was someone sending us an email here. PokerShare.com was entering a chimp into the main event. They claimed, did Harris allow this? And please tell us if you know anything. I've seen videos of the chimp on YouTube.com. His name is Mikey, and he has been trained to play a little, but not well at all. They at least not as well them. as Gavin Smith. They, they did not let him play. They did first. not let him play. He's a very cute chimp. I had my picture taken with him. <laughs> I like Mikey. <laughs> I like Mikey too, but they did not let him play. This is what true. Was the, what was the reasoning? Because he's a chimp. <laughs> <laughs> but then I assume that they had. Go- <laughs> I assume they had gone through all that though. If they even got to uh, advertise and everything, uh, I think they probably just got the advertising out of it either way. I mean, it's not. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like saying you're gonna put a dragon. And people are gonna be like, what? They're gonna put a dragon <laughs> in the World Series main event? Except dragons crazy. aren't real. Dragons don't exist. Well, if Mikey li- says you, if Mikey's listening, <laughs> I just want him to know, Mikey, you're my favorite chimp. <laughs> Mikey, if you're if you're listening and you speak English and understand human. <laughs> we want you to know this. And if you do speak English and understand humans, you should have been allowed to play in the main event. Come on Very down. True. We'll have you on as Very a guest point. on the circuit. I love. Oh, I would love to have Mikey. Two on. part Mikey. episode with Mikey. We want Mikey. Awesome. If Mikey's handlers are listening, we would love to have Mikey. Bring on him the show. down to the right, But if the handlers have on. to speak for him, we don't really want to hear it. Am I right? No, of course not. We okay. want him to interact with us. All right. More information here that we have to distribute. Scott, Gavin, Joe. Hey guys, love the show. It's gotten me through many long work days. I've been playing online, low stakes, limit hold them, ten cent, twenty cent for a few weeks now and I've managed to build my bankroll up from $10 to about $60 or so. I've played No Limit Hold'em with friends before but never online. Should I move into a slightly higher stakes limit game, 25 50 cent or 50 cent a dollar, or should I try my hand at No Limit Play online? What would be best for improving my game and or growing my bankroll? Thanks, in from Ohio. Hmm. It depends on what he wants to I don't think he should move up yet. Yeah. I don't think he has enough yet to move up to the 25 50 cent game. And I definitely wouldn't just jump into the no limit game if he hasn't been playing that. You know, that. Because yeah. there's so much. I mean, you can lose so much more so quickly in that game if you're playing no limit. So I don't know if that's, if that's what he wants to do. And it depends on, on what, like I was saying, what he wants to accomplish. Does he want to, you know, he really wants to build his bankroll or is he still trying to learn in the game? I would say, too, if he's playing limit right now and he's going to go to no limit, uh, I mean, the concepts are so completely different between no limit and limit play. I would get a bunch of books on no limit right. and read your ass off and then go up because I mean it, it's completely different skill set yeah very different game do you know we have a couple of magazines we're supposed to be sending out autographed copies you know Joey and Wareham we told them we would send them one so we're going to have to get the intern okay. on doing that because we actually uh, Joey actually sent something and I believe I forget the other person's name someone else sent in that we owe them one so we got to make sure we do right. that very soon it's coming to you Joey and Wareham we're right happy. after this part two of our interview with 10 time bracelet winner Mr. Mulai Phil Helmuth on the circuit the circuit I'm Howard Lederer. Even top poker pros like me have to sharpen their games, and the best place to do that is at Full Tilt Poker. It's where you can learn, chat, and play with some of the game's best pros like Phil Ivey, Chris Ferguson, Jennifer Harmon, and Phil Gordon. So come sharpen your game at FullTiltPoker.com. This is Chris Ferguson, and you're listening to The Circuit. Well, I have an email here from uh, from Andrew, who was probably jumping at home reading our online updates when he found out that you won. It just says, Phil, I knew you could do it, buddy. Congrats. I love you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I mean, <laughs> it's nice to have. Uh, it's. It's. I do feel a lot of love from the poker world. I mean, I, when I was going for number ten and I finished second, that was like a light switch too. Because I think that even if you don't like me for some reason, and everybody and all the great players know that I have a great heart, so they, you know, all the great players love me. I know that. But even if you don't like me from television or whatever, or you've seen this or that, or you feel like I slighted you, you had to be rooting for me to win number 10, right? Mm-hmm. When I came up short with that huge chip lead, I felt like, for the first time, I felt a little bit like Greg Norman or somebody, you know? I mean, someone who just came up short. Phil and I Mickelson felt like it was going to be, or Mickelson, yeah, before. I felt like there's going to be an outpouring of love here because I'm shaking everybody's hands. I'm not being a jerk at the table at all, hardly. Mm. And I think, you know, people are finally starting to say 
you know, uh, we like Phil. I, I think number 10 begs a couple of questions, one of which is you told Chip Reese back at the uh, Bay 101 that over the next 10 years you were going to show him and everyone else in the poker world who doubts that, uh, you know, you have a love for the game or that you're one of the greatest in the world, that you're going to show them who you are. Is this the start of that, this World Series of Poker? Well, are you I mean, thinking about it? I've had this bad rap in the side games. So it's been irritating. I think I had three, maybe four losing trips in the side games in like two and a half years. But I would set people up all the time. I'd, I'd be at the bicycle club. I wanted to get action in the side games. I wanted to, to present an illusion of bad play. So I'd be playing like a triple draw game in the small blind or something. You know what I mean? And, and I'd, I'd call like, you know, maybe we're playing 400. I'd call 200 and I'd draw five cards and I'd call Mike Mattisau over. Hmm. And I'd say, I'd call the 200 just to get Mike over. Say, Mike, I, I'm playing so bad right now. I'd maybe be 40,000 ahead. I'm playing so bad. I'm on such tilt. Look at this. I'm drawing five cards again. He'd come over. He'd see that the dealer handed me the five cards. I'd call him over just then, and he'd go tell everybody in the room how bad I was playing. You know what I mean? <laughs> I used this routine for two years. Yeah, I'd be like winning every, you know, win, 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 but telling everybody how bad I'm playing. And I'd play an Omaha eight or better hand, always early in the session where I'd play like the king, queen, nine, eight. You know what I mean? And I'd. I'd like, you know, raise with it. And, uh, and at the end of the pot, I'd like win with kings and queens. I'd say, Mike, look at this hand that I played in early. I always call Mike because you can depend <laughs> on him to tell the whole room how bad you play. <laughs> call Mike or call somebody who you know is going to be really loud, right? And I'd say, Mike, look at this hand. I played the king, queen, nine, eight with one suit under the gun right. in the four and eight hundred game. I knew, I'm playing so bad, but I knew I was going to make kings and queens and scoop it. I'm playing so bad right now, and Mike would run all over to everybody in the room, you know. And then, if, and then what would I do? I'd go into a shell and wait for like Ace Deuce or Ace Three Four for like three hours, <laughs> and then occasionally play like a reckless. But you can get away with it in Deuce to Seven, you know. I mean, you can you can like. Mike started to get wise to me a little bit. If I was in the big blind and had to draw five, I'd stop calling him over because if I didn't call a raise, he started to figure that much out. Right. But Mike's been my ally that way. I mean. And, in fact, this year he decided he was going to book me in the side games for the entire year. Really? I mean, he really thinks – I warned him a million times. I said, you're such an idiot. Why do you want to book me mm -hmm. in the side games? And because he booked me, uh, I didn't play as often this year, you know, and I'm – what, I'm up 160,000. But we put a cap on it, mm -hmm. um, 400,000. So at the end of the year, I'm going to try to win exactly 400 and quit, and then Mike will owe me 400. And then it will, you know – that's my goal. Yeah, even out. So about proving yourself to guys like Chip and these other guys, do you feel like this was a start in the tournaments or you're just trying to do it in the side games? Now, by the way, I'm not as good as your dad in the side games. <laughs> well, few are. Few are. <laughs> few are. <laughs> Let's give Barry Greenstein props. <laughs> Joe, doesn't Joe doesn't have a dad anymore. Yeah. He's disowned me after losing my bet to Gavin for the World Series. <laughs> It's hard, it's hard to love a son who dresses up like Robin. <laughs> it's just it's difficult. I understand. I can't really blame the guy. But you want to hear something funny, though? Barry Greenstein came on this show and told the world that he could teach a primate to beat me. But he couldn't teach Joe to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know that I would brag so much. You're, you're acting as if you were dominant, and I, I was out of the race early on. He couldn't teach Joe to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, my friend, eked out a victory by the skin of your teeth, despite my huge rush at the end, by finishing 50 in this one and trying to uh, cash in the limit. So you, my friend, should be modest and happy that you are not dressed up as a superhero and walk about your way. <laughs> what he, costume were you going to wear, Gavin? He couldn't, he couldn't teach Joe to do it. I was <laughs> never going to have to wear a costume. Oh, you were sweating so hard the last day. You're so full of shit. Well, as far as the as number 10 goes, another thing I think a lot of people are wondering, we had a phone call, but I wanted to ask it first, which is, you know, now you're knocking on the door of Card Players Player of the Year. You're in sixth there. You're playing great poker. Do you feel like because of this and because of the successful World Series that you had that you're going to start playing more tournament poker? I mean, you were complaining there's only six more big ones before the end of the year. Are we no. going to see it with all of them? No, I'm not. I'm not going to go for the Player of the Year. Um, I, I, think, I think the Player of the Year, I'm impressed with the guys that do it, you know, and I'm not knocking anything thing that they do I think it's really impressive to see somebody like a Min the Master or Michael Mizraki just you know go out there and play you know 20 30 tournaments a month that's impressive you know but it's not easy and and I can't I can't keep my family number one and do that you know I just can't do it and and, and I like my life I like hosting my own television show I like writing books I like writing articles and a lot of that stuff 
keeps me home where I can be with my wife and children. A lot of the business deals I do, you know, uh, shooting commercials. I'm only gone for a day to do that. You know, you got to shoot a national commercial in L.A. Fly down, fly home, right? I can't, I can't do that. I mean, uh, the Card Player of the Year award is not something I'll ever win, I don't think, unless, unless I happen to win like two World Poker Tour tournaments this year and I happen to luck into it. Well, how many are we going to see you at? That's that's another question. Yeah. Well, I'm going to try. I'm going to try to play in a year like this where I know I'm really, really playing at a high level. I'm going to try to play a lot more World Poker Tour tournaments the rest of the year. More than I usually would. I mean, I hate flying to Foxwoods for one day, and I don't... You know, going private jet's much better for something like Foxwoods, you know? And, yeah, uh, I know mm-hmm. the feeling. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so, I mean, I'll do the... You know, the showmans will have a private jet going to all the World Poker Tour tournaments, so I'll just find myself in Vegas and go with them because it's the way to do it, you know? And then, you know, if I get eliminated early, it just costs you so much time to get to, like, to the East Coast, you know? You have to, like... I, I won't do a red eye again in my life, so... So what do you have to do? You have to like take the the noon flight. You arrive at like midnight or something, right? And then, right? And then you, there's a day gone, and it's just it's just a pain to. All I know is I want to fly with Phil too, because I'm gonna kick his ass in Chinese poker. <laughs> <laughs> we would have a lot of fun playing Chinese, Gavin. <laughs> we'll, we'll have to get you on the deck just for the Chinese action, of course. I think Joe and I are on it now. Yeah, You've Joe been kind of hot, right? Guys. What are we on it? I think we're gonna fly with these guys. Most of us. We've been offered, yeah. We've been offered. I How haven't done that? it yet, but I mean, I occasionally will fly with Lyle or yeah. some of my friends. But but I'm like Phil. I live in California. I don't live in Las Vegas, so I don't know that I'm going to fly to Las Vegas just to get on to fly. Yeah, that's a problem to too, it. right? Yeah, I mean, that's the only thing. So I mean, yeah, going for the Player of the Year is not something that's on my priority list, and and you know, I mean, if you look at years past, I almost won the Player of the Year twice. And had I, you know, only playing in the big tournaments. Now, that was probably one of right. my most impressive years. Not playing in the 1K. 2000 was my most impressive year as far as the player of the year goes. I won two tournaments in Europe that didn't count, <laughs> you know? And Min beat me by, like, 50 points anyway, mm-hmm. you know? And I skipped a million tournaments. I mean, I was hot that year. And had I put the effort in to show up to, like, 15 tournaments, I'm sure I would have won player of the year that year. And I just, you know, just didn't do it. And, and you know, and so I'm going to fall short like Johnny Chan's going to fall short and like Doyle's going to fall short. A lot of us great players cannot make the time and effort to, to play in, you know, in these poker tournaments. And, and, and you're, in the past, Barry wouldn't play in them. Your mm-hmm. father, Barry Greenstein, wouldn't play in them either. I mean, um, perhaps he does now with the charity stuff he's right. doing. And, it's just too much, you know, and uh, I've got two kids at home yet. So, Well, to sort of bring the uh, our question, before we open it up for the uh, phone questions, uh, to bring it full circle, what happened with the win bet with James Van Alstein, the $100,000 win bet that you proposed at the WPT Championship when he busted you with the Ace-10? Um, Did that count? Did your win count? We had an argument about that at the World Series in an early tournament, and uh, I said if he really wanted it, he could have it. I mean, if he felt like we made a bet, he could have the bet. That would be okay with me. I said, but... I don't want to have it, and, and, and I think that's going to favor you, James, because I think I'm going to win one. But I don't want to have it because I don't want to have to worry about anyone else in the room. I don't make last longer bets. I don't stake people. When I show up to a poker tournament, now I'm staking a bunch of people until Thursday. But everybody knows their contract's up Wednesday at midnight. And I have to help some friends out and do some stuff. And, I mean, I have some people in the main event, too, because you have to take a shot, mm-hmm. you know. And, you know, I mean, I've obviously cashed for well over a million this year just at the series. So I have to take some shots in the main event. But I don't like staking people uh, during the World Series of Poker. I mean, it's a distraction. Last night I was I was going to bet at 145 or something. I just beat the, you know, the, the 1503 game or whatever, giving my buddy Greg Pearson some private lessons. I'm going to bed. And I realized that I had two horses left in the main event. And I said, you know what? Now's the time for me to make an appearance. They need a boost of energy late in the day. I'm an expert at staking people. I did it for so many years. So I got dressed. <laughs> I hauled my ass over to the Rio. <laughs> you know what I mean? I ended up going to bed at 530. You know? And, uh, and so staking people takes energy and effort and your focus away. And uh, it's just something that you won't find me doing at the World Series of Poker, almost so, ever. What was the ultimate determination then? Did you just, uh, decide against the distraction? Did James say he wanted the win bet, or did he say no? 
did you win $100,000 for the bracelet? No, 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 no. No, we, he, he decided that that was okay. He understood. He, he didn't want the distraction either. But I, I said, listen, I don't care. If you want the bet, you can have it. You know, I mean, if you feel like we made a bet and shook on it, you can have the bet. I mean, I don't care. I'm not running from the bet. I mean, I just, you know, would prefer not to be distracted. I mean, I don't care. Winning bracelets isn't about the money. You know, it's about... I, I, you know, the, the first tournament, I guess it was 800000 for first. I didn't know what first place was. On day one, day two, I didn't know what first you place was. You knew it was, was. gold. knew it was a bracelet. <laughs> I mean, it was only when I heard him talking, like, you know, late in the t- they make you take your walk went off, you know, at the final table. And I happened to hear the numbers. I wasn't even trying to listen. I didn't know what first place was in the event I won after two days. I heard when it got down to four-handed, they were talking about, oh, the jump in money isn't that much. It goes from 200 to 300 or something or whatever. And I was like, all right, whatever. And then when I won it, I said, well, how much did I win? 631000 Okay. How much did I win for a second? 400 and some thousand, you know. But I honestly didn't even know. Whereas 10 years ago, um, I may have had a lot of money. Maybe I was a millionaire because of my house and stocks and whatever. Mm. But then I needed money to pay bills. And so then I'd be like, all right, what's first place? You know, 150000 Okay, second place. And, well, you got to make sure you get at least second, you know. Uh, that's three months' worth of bills, 60000 or whatever. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And uh, so you'd be a little bit more focused on the money. But now, so then maybe you have a motivation in life from desperation. And now it's, it's all about inspiration. Now it's like the Olympics for Phil. It's all about gold. We have a couple phone calls for you, Phil, before we let you go. Danny, take it away, buddy. Hi, this is Paul calling from London. Um, just wanted to congratulate Phil on his victory last week um, from all of us over here. And a question for him. I saw that you were friends with uh, Corey Pavin, the golfer, <laughs> and I yeah. see that he won on Sunday his first, first win in 10 years. And I wondered whether, I know a lot of poker players play golf. Um, you guys talk about similarity in the game. I was kind of thinking about it, about... You know, you can choke at the end of a golf game and you have a, you know, only one will survive and be the ultimate winner. I wonder if there are similarities and uh, tips that you pass between each other and if you could uh, let us know a couple of those. Okay, Phil, thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, you know, um, I I hope, I hope that, I hope that, you know, by Corey watching me at the final table that I inspired him a little bit. Um, I have no indication that's true. <laughs> he didn't call me and say you inspired me or anything like that. But I know when I finished sixth, um, I said, listen, I said, I'm going to, I fought through hell. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to come back and win again. And I'm a champion, you know. And uh, I know that, you know, when Marco Mira was hanging out with Tiger Woods, all of a sudden he won two majors. So I'd like to think that maybe I had a small part to do, but probably not, you know. I mean, uh, I know this. uh, uh, Speaking of London, I was doing a big London television special, and I made them all wait in the other half of my suite for an hour as I watched the end of the golf tournament. No way in hell am I going to not watch Corey hit all those shots. So um, so that that was, I mean, I, I, what can I say? I, I, I was really, really, you know, happy for Corey. I, I do have another story about that. As Corey was knocking in the putt on television, it was a one-footer, and all he had to do was two-putt from one feet, right? Mm. So right as he hit the putt, I hit the call button. To my friend Carl Westcott, who I knew was at the green, was right next to the green. I mean, he has the PJ Tour pass, and it rang five times on the fifth ring. Carl answered the phone and I said, "What are you doing? You can't answer a phone. This is a PJ Tour event." He said, "Well, I did, and besides, the tournament ended one second ago." I said, "Well, just tell Corey, you know, that I wish him my best, and you know, congratulations." and you know, that was kind of the end of that. <laughs> I'll take the next one. Right, oh, wait, by, by the way. Poker brat. Hold on. Go, go ahead. ahead. By the way, um, uh, Russ Hamilton offered me a bet where Corey and I scrambled together against him and someone else. And uh, But I know Russ, is, Russ just wanted the bet because the guy that he has on his team hits the ball 100 yards longer than Corey. Yeah, ni- nice bet, Ross. I've never beat him on a golf bet, basically. Nobody in the world has. Yeah. I actually beat him once, uh, but he, he's pissed off. R- R- Russ and I are, are, he keeps arranging golf matches for us, and uh, he comes up and he says, Gavin, you know, do you want to take this bet? And all I ever say is, Russ, any bet you want to make for me, I'm down with that. That's cool. I've never lost with <laughs> Russ as a golf put- partner, and I'm not a hustler. I just say, Russ, I'm playing great. You know, I'm not going to hustle. I'm going to play my best all day long from start to finish. I'm not a golf hustler. 
He says, yeah, I know that. We'll find a way to win. And he does all the talking, and somehow we end up with all the money every day. <laughs> Hi, this message is for the Poker Brat, or uh, Joe and Gavin. Uh, this is Dave in Boston, and I was wondering, uh, you know, in these big, huge tournaments with big, huge fields, uh, uh, the Poker Brat and his DVD says to play tight, play the top ten hands early on, and then uh, maybe loosen up with the blinds and annies kicking. But I was wondering, uh, how do you really get chips going early? I mean, if you're not getting hit in the head of the deck, uh, flopping monsters or getting good starting hands, uh, you know, what do you do? Uh, how much lose, how much tight do you go by play or where you go by feel or what do you go by? Thanks a lot. Enjoy the show. Gavin. I don't ever play tight. We yeah, know. Phil, do you actually play yeah, like you say in the book, top ten hands only in the, in the early levels? Without the annies, a lot of times I play that way, yeah. And sometimes Chris Ferguson and I joke about it. You know, we sleep at the table. I mean, that's, the series is a marathon. And so I'll take my sunglasses off, turn my hat backwards, put my elbow in a V, and I'll, and I'll actually sleep at the table. I'll put my hand out in so front of me. So when the cards hit my hand, it wakes me up, right? And I can hear the dealer shuffling, so I know right before. And I'll pull the cards in. I'll, I'll look up with, you know, like half slumbered, half sleeping, <laughs> you know, queen jack off suit. All right, I'm in sleeping mode. I fold. <laughs> you know what I mean? What the hell? You know, I mean, you just have to have an hour or two pass. Yeah. And hopefully you pick up five big hands. You do well with them because they play so bad. And it's particularly when I'm at a table, wherever I raise, they re-raise, which happens a fair amount these days. Then I really like to just sleep. Hmm. You know, and fold and fold and fold and fold and fold. Now, if I'm at a super passive table, you know, um, then maybe I'll make a few more moves. You know, I mean, uh, uh, lately, lately I've been playing a few more hands, and but I'll, I'll, I'll jump from one to the other. But sometimes I'll make I'll open for the blinds are fifteen hundred. I'll open for two fifty, three hundred for a number of hands, and then for no reason at all, I'll just go back into a shell for an hour. So I mix right. it up a little bit. I, nothing is set in stone. Annie was laughing at me because I didn't play a hand for four rounds, which is right. just insane for me. But I had a lot of chips, and everybody at my table seemed to be crazy. So I'll wait, 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 wait. And then all of a sudden, under the gun, I opened with king four of hearts. You know, and uh, that froze the guy with the two jacks. Yeah. And then the ten seven of hearts called. And, of course, I got lucky. It came ace-deuce-three with the deuce-three of hearts. And I said, oh, I could even fold this hand on the flop. I don't, I don't play like the rest of the world. I'll just check it. Check. The jacks check. The ten seven of hearts check. Now, bam, now the heart came off. Right. No more checking. And now I let out. Now <laughs> I have the nuts. I have to lead out, and it's going to look suspicious. And this guy raised, and I re-raised, and he moved all in, and I called him instantly. And... And Annie just said, what the hell happened this hand? <laughs> you didn't play a hand for four rounds. <laughs> you open with the king four of hearts. And the other guy, Jeff, I think, Freilich, you know, who won a bracelet this year, Eric. said, Eric Freilich, he said, yeah. what the hell happened? I mean, I couldn't even raise you with Jack. You didn't play a hand for four rounds. He said, but I should have. <laughs> and I said, well, all right, whatever. I mean, you would have beat me for whatever, 800. Right. You know, instead I won 15,000 or 12,000 from a guy, you know, drawn dead. And uh, it was nice when he didn't turn over the set. I didn't think he had the nut flush. But he wasn't even live. So, I mean, I, I do sometimes weird things. I don't know why I open under the gun with king four. I know that, that I then went into... kind of standard to me. <laughs> I went into a shell again, and I had seven eight suited. Uh, I didn't play another hand for two rounds. I opened with seven eight suited under the gun. And uh, it went uh, call, call, call. Of course, the queen smooth called me. And then the idiot in the big blind um, <laughs> re-raised with king-queen. And then, of course, the queens moved all in when it got back to them. Mm. And then I had the horror of watching the flop come 7-7-3. Seven, seven, Gee. I was saying, what in the hell just happened here? <laughs> you know, I would have busted this yeah. guy. <laughs> So you take what the table gives you a bit. Before you go, you have a new book, uh, or you're part of a new book that came out with your friend Joe Navarro. Is that right? Tell us about that Joe is a, well. Joe's a pretty amazing guy. I mean, he, he, I mean, the stuff that when you go to when you go to Camp Helmuth is where is where is where this stuff started happening. I mean, that's where I noticed it. He also does seminars and television shows. FBI profiler for 28 years. He has a book called Read Him and Weep. And Read Him and Reap. Is what it's called, and uh, it, it's it's a fantastic book. No one's really done much with identifying tells other than Mike Carroll, right? But Mike Carroll comes from the poker side of things, 
whereas Joe Navarro has stories he can't even tell us. You know, classified stories, you know, about Russian spies and whatever. I mean, he's been profiler for 28 years. And so he knows what it means when you lick your lips, when you give the steeple. Imagine this, you people at home. The steeple is like you put your hands together in front of you, palm to palm, and put it like right in front of your chin. Yeah, and then yeah, spread your fingers out. A lot. Mm. That's the steeple. Whenever you do the steeple, you're super, super strong, unless you're like licking your lips or moving with your mouth. So I went to the bicycle club just after being a Camp Halmuth, and I bluffed 10 pots early in the tournament. And, every, and the reason I kept bluffing is every time I'd bluff, I'd do the steeple. And that sent a message to everybody's brains that I was strong. Mm. They folded the first nine, and finally I got caught in the tenth, and I said, well... Now, now they're going to look at the steeple differently. I better wait for a new table. <laughs> so it's called it's called read them and reap. And what did you have to do with the book? You just read a forward for him or something, or were you actually? Involved? I wrote a forward, and uh, I mean, it, the guy is unbelievable. Yeah, I, mean, I've met I wouldn't, him before. wouldn't write a forward just for anybody. Right. But what he did, he just got the best reviews at the camp of anybody, better than me, uh, which pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> but it's good. I mean, you know, you want to have people that are great at teaching at your camp, and uh, so I mean, I knew that I knew that he knew his stuff, and. So it's like James Bond on tells, and Phil wrote the forward for it. Yeah. All right, we look forward to seeing you at some, some more WPTs. Congratulations on number 10. We appreciate you coming back. Bye. Congratulations on being on the circuit again. <laughs> Phil, how are you there, buddy? Thanks, Phil. Card Player is proud to announce that all books and DVDs will be 50% off for a limited time. From Doyle's Super System to Phil Helmuth's instructional DVDs, you can find everything you need to improve your game at pokerstore.cardplayer.com. <laughs> Welcome back to the circuit, everyone. We are broadcasting on Sports Byline Radio on Sirius Channel 122 on CardPlayer.com and on the iTunes Music Store as a podcast. Scott Huff, Gavin Smith, and Joe Seabach here at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. And we have uh, a few other people around right now because the Bellagio Cup is going on. We have John Fan, Grant Lang, Eric Firestone. I can see all these people in my view right, right. now. That's part of the fun of doing the show down here. Quindo. Quindo, Quindo we just saw. By. Bracelet winner Quindo. Vanessa right. Russo. Carmel Petresco right over there. And if you want to be down here, you can check out Card Player Poker, www.cardplayer.com slash free poker. And you can register for our monthly free rolls worth $3,000. Tony, Tony Cousineau. Every month, Card Player Poker offers you a chance <laughs> to play Zin. and win. And actually, right now, I'm sure you guys didn't know this, but the Card Player Poker winner from last Steve year. Steve Daneman. Jim Coca. Steve, too. Is still alive in the main event. So that's good news as well. Who else are you guys pointing out? Go ahead. So this is we're, looking, we're, we're, looking, we're looking around the room, man. Check that out at uh, www.cardplayer.com slash free poker. That was the most seamless plug we've ever done right I don't there. See, I'm not, I don't see anybody else. We see the grinder. Where's the grinder? Grinder's here. I don't see him. Why not? I don't see the grinder. I don't see the grinder. I see the grinder. He just put his hand up in the air, actually. Oh, really? Where is he? I don't see him. Yep. Poker ho. Poker ho. Mark Kroon. Mark Kroon. All right. We'd like to thank all of our guests. We'd like to thank Phil Helmuth, John Fan, Poker ho, Mark Kroon. <laughs> I'd like to thank you guys for another great show. You're so I want to thank so you, welcome. Scott Huff, for just being Scott Huff. And I want to thank you, too, Danny, for being Danny. I even want to thank Shrunk. Thanks, Shrunk. Man, if Gavin ever wins an Oscar, <laughs> it's going to be long. We'll be back tomorrow with more Circuit. Thanks for listening, everybody. Later.